When I was a boy, the spirit world terrified and tortured me, taking my rest and innocence in one fell swoop at the age of five in Wales. I survived but was forever changed. Now, years later, after nearly losing my sight, I have decided to leave the shadows. People around the world now know these things they previously could dismiss are real and have, with a complete lack of common sense, decided to brave the dangers of the spiritual realm, a stunt akin to dancing in traffic with a blindfold on. Reassembling an old team with my gifted childhood friend, we seek to train a new generation of folks to assist us in reaching around the globe to the fires that have been started by the careless, the foolish, and the utterly incompetent. Welcome with me, please, Joel Robinson, Reiki healer and gifted shaman, Sonia Lamont, Wiccan and gifted woman of talent. Today's episode... Welcome and thank you for watching our latest show. Today we begin the first of our new series dealing with movies that were based on true life events of the paranormal that caught Hollywood's attention. In many cases, the real story behind the movie is not only more engrossing, but wildly different, much more horrifying, and also more dangerous than presented in celluloid. As is the case to be made that the book is better than the movie most times, the movies, as you will hear, change much of the narrative to make the, a, the film a better experience. And in some, they outright chase off into completely different territory than is presented with the original tale so that it makes the fear and horror closer to home for the viewer. Whatever else may be said for the films, they are part of our culture now. Addressing the real life stories below the surface waters the movies have made has fascinated me over the past months. During my research and investigating, reading and gathering, I have been awed at times and saddened to severe melancholy at others. The story of a haunting in Connecticut is rather fantastical to some, but the source material itself was adhered to fairly closely. What makes the movie truly sad is that the real life boy these events were based on died of cancer in 2012 after beating Hodgkin's lymphoma as a child. In amongst the metaphysical nightmare he endured for years. The real family the story is about is the Snedekers. Their eldest son, Philip, needed to be closer to the hospital where he was receiving radioactive cobalt treatments to stop his cancer from progressing. And the distance he had to travel from home was about eight hours with all the stops he had to make to throw up during his chemo treatments. Though it was less when they switched to radiation, his body pains were so severe alongside the expression of the inner radiation burns that seared his flesh, his mother decided she couldn't drag him through the long round trip ordeal anymore. Now, as you see in the film, Philip was seeing things, and in some cases, it was things his family saw, not him. As for instance, the scene where his mother is mopping the and the water turns to blood, she saw that, not Philip. The scene with the sparkling bulbless uh, fixtures did occur. The shower curtain scene was actually something that happened to Carmen, not her niece. The differences that Hollywood put in were more for ease of story making and sensationalism. Because after all, who's going to care about a uh, middle-aged woman in a shower as opposed to a 19-something nubile girl getting almost killed by a shower curtain? Where things depart the most severely are along the lines of the psychics, the seances, and the priests that came in eventually. Hollywood likes to make gifted folk look the butt of the source of all of our own problems when in fact we do not usually create these issues you see there was no necromancy done and bodies stored in the house though this is a plausible thing someone could do if they were damn stupid enough to want to see what happens when that particular pandora's box is open and of course saying that they could get away with this much body snatching also there was no psychic helping the funeral homeowner to do the experiments he wanted nor can a physical medium blow you up or incinerate you if the ghosts want to get you Conjuring ectoplasm is gross to watch and requires a lot of effort to surrender oneself to the outside influences to create, but it doesn't look uh, like more than a creeping snot trail uh, in the air or around one's mouth like you, you kissed Slimer uh, from the Ghostbusters. Uh, to get back to the original cause of the hauntings and the violence and changes in Philip, according to the Warrens and confirmed by Carmen Snedeker, former workers at the funeral home were found guilty of necrophilia, and that created the disturbing presence that lingered. Philip made a deal with a tall man that presumably was the director of the hauntings in the home, and this entity started using the dying uh, boy's body uh, to write strange and dark passages in a journal. Uh, Philip, being dyslexic, had issues writing, and yet with the entity driving him, had neat, clean, perfect penmanship. What he wrote was dark and chilling, and when one of his cousins uh, peeped at it, realized that this was obviously not normal. The women in the house were uh, being molested, covers dragged off at night, bra straps being pulled. When Carmen spoke to the doctors in charge of Philip, they explained his changes sounded like schizophrenia. Of course, because it's easy to diagnose from a distance. It's sad to hear that they um, didn't check into it. 
or had a professional um, talk to them because they would have been able to definitely say that that was the erroneous diagnosis. Oh, it's a classic case of fishing for a, uh, or shopping for a diagnosis. Because even though Carmen had seen things, she wanted to believe that everything was Phil- was Philip's fault. I swear to you. The more that I did the reading, the more I realized. And it was sad because he ended up estranged from his mother because of it. I mean, he <laughs> it was really quite bad. Well, your mum having you committed for something you're not the fault of, it would put a strain on your relationship. Yes. And the the night that she had it done, there was no warning. It, she made sure that there was that they came and go. Well, first of all, she actually hunted around to find someone who could give her an explanation. When she found a doctor that was willing, without ever diagnosing or talking to Philip, uh, to diagnose him as schizophrenic, uh, she was perfectly willing to latch onto it so that she could blame somebody else for her apparent breaks with sanity because she saw a lot of things. Things did attack her, but up until the point that Philip was removed from the house, things didn't get really, really bad because he had decided, no joke, to make himself available to this dark man, this tall, dark person, to keep them off the rest of the family. And the night that he was taken away, he warned him, he says, now that I'm not here, they're coming after you. And then they took it as, oh, he's just you know threatening us. And most of the really bad stuff that happened, happened after that. Uh, it's sad that, you know, said, you know, up until recently, you cannot talk about paranormal stuff with people. Most people would just automatically think that you was nutters right off the yeah. bat. A classic example of what happened after the after Philip was taken from the home was what if you saw it in the film, the uh, attack on the niece that actually happened to Carmen. The thing was so pissed that it literally tried to kill her. And what occurred was the, um, if you remember the where it looked like it was just trying to smother her, it, it wasn't like that at all. It was like it was glued to Carmen. And if she had, she'd been screaming in the, in the bathroom as it was tightening and tightening and tightening. And if her niece hadn't heard and then come running and then got a pair of scissors to cut the thing away from her mouth, she'd have died. It, once the thing was cut away from her mouth and the thing started tightening on her body until she, it started affecting her breathing, it didn't finally let go, realizing it wasn't going to be able to kill her. So it let go and dropped her. That was one of the big ones. And then there was the sexual attacks that happened on the niece. I've forgotten the niece's name. Yeah, that's, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> One of the scenes with the younger brother where he was in the bed, I'm sorry, not in the bed, was put on one of those, uh, I don't know what they call those tables where they do the work on the the corpse to prepare it. But, the mortuary uh, bed. I, yeah. Uh, right. where, where he was spinning the, the lab. Yeah, where he was, he was spinning the kid. That really did occur. On several occasions, uh, it was like Philip was oh. someone completely different, looked completely different, acted completely different. It was like somebody else was sitting behind his eyes because he had willingly given himself to this guy. It wasn't just the handwriting. There was also really strange events like that where the, where the people in the house were frightened of him because it was like he was ready to just kill them. And he, The actor did a more than passable job of looking like he was not in the, the driver's seat with his own body, especially in the occasions where they were getting intimidated. They really needed to bring that up because he... It, he was walking around like a feral animal staring at everybody like they were he was sizing them up for a, a body bag and that's part of the reason why Carmen started hunting for the uh, she started hunting for a diagnosis to be able to blame on the, on uh, Philip and avoid her own uh, culpability in the situation yeah I mean how, what's the chances that you find a house that you need and it's haunted. Well, according to uh, two different versions of the story, and nobody knows if this is Carmen at first trying to hide responsibility or if it was Carmen um, didn't really know. But to some people, she had said that she had no idea that the place had once been a funeral home. And 
her husband and several others said, oh, no, we always knew. She had always known, but she didn't think that it was going to be any kind of a big issue. She didn't, which I'm sorry, uh, most thinking folks are not going to go, let's move into the old funeral home. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's oh, yeah. I'm... <laughs> it, oh. Just, it just sounds crazy to me. Yeah, especially if it's like an old house and it was like, yeah, back in the the early 1900s, this used to be a funeral home. Oh, is this the original building? Yes. Yeah, matter of fact, they used to do the autopsies downstairs. They used to prep the bodies downstairs. No. Let's <laughs> go look at the next house. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I found is that a great many funeral homes that I go past you get no feeling whatsoever. But there's now and then you come past one and it's it's a very serious hot spot. In fact, here in Lancaster, California, just off of Lancaster Boulevard, there is a funeral home and it is I can't even get near it because of how much energy, negative, weird vibes come off it. Now, it's not because I, I repulsed by it and I couldn't get close. It's just I don't want to see whatever the thing is vibing out. Honestly, there are some things you just don't need to share. And it, it's true. It's not every one of these things. Uh, just like I believe Brent and Dawn on Paranormal Portal talk about. Yeah, it's, it's not all of them, but there are some. And it's just, I don't really feel like getting near the darn things for whatever reason that the things become active. Most bodies are not, they, the spirits don't hang around. They don't hang around funeral homes. I've been to several funerals and I've actually been in these funeral homes and looked around and there is um, spiritual energy, but I've never seen ghosts. But once again, some of them, they give off that vibe and I just can't get close. And it's a rarity. It's, I'd have to say I've probably been near over a hundred of the darn things. But this one in downtown Lancaster is the only one that repulses me. The only one. Have you two either encountered anything like that? Um, actually once. And that was my um, Betty's first husband's house because he used to work from home and he used to be the embalmer for funeral homes. And the, his business was actually at home. And he had the cellar as the place he actually put bodies. And that you felt, so I, and you felt it, the something there. Yeah, because uh, they found out he was, he was uh, doing necrophiliac with the bodies. With certain See? bodies. See, that's, and that's what, the, what happened with this house. It, the, uh, when you have a home like this where they're pulling in the Ghost Adventures crew of their time, which were the Warrens, you know somebody did something. Oh, because it. You, let, let me back up. The Ghost Adventures crew of their time that weren't preposterous. There we go. Okay, I, I have to have my little dig at at, uh, at it's the devil, Mama, because it's just can't you can't let it sit. In any case, so <laughs> so when the Warrens come in, it's it's in it's in important. It's troublesome. In fact. Um, just to go over it, like, okay. Uh, once Philip was dragged from his house and blamed as the cause of the covered being dragged, uh, plates willfully broken, the boy warned them, okay, like I told you, that once he was gone, they were going to be targeted. That night, Carmen, okay, tell me how who this sounds like. Carmen went to Philip's room downstairs and dared the tall man to come play with her. This is not a joke. She went downstairs and then screamed at it. She's playing out with Zach's playbook. Yeah. Before Zach ever had a playbook. <laughs> so she dared the tall man to come and play with her. As a reward for taking away the house's channeled focus, Carmen was nearly smothered by the shower curtain, like I said. Okay. But that night also, the creature decided that Tammy, ah, that Tammy is the name of the niece, uh, was next and she'd helped save Carmen and the hunt was on. All the crucifixes in the house disappeared. Okay? Gone. That's creepy. So keep this in mind. Remember people say if you put a lot of belief into a thing that it, it'll stick around. It It's like, okay, if you held up a, uh, a it, it's like trying to drive off a, uh, a vampire with a Jewish star. 
Now, if if anybody remembers the movie uh, um, Love at First Bite, remember when when uh, the psychiatrist pulls out saying, "What do you think of this her count?" And he says, "I think you should find a nice Jewish girl and leave Miss Cindy alone." He goes, "Oh shit, is this the wrong one?" It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> One of my favorite movies, by the way. Oh, shit, is it the wrong one? Yeah, it's the wrong one. See, sometimes it's not the thing that's going to work. And so they drag the darn things off, and it's like, what are you going to do now? And so off it went. I'm trying not to be funny about this, but it is kind of funny since they had the whole house was completely filled with crosses. Okay. They had them over every doorway. They had several on each wall. They thought that this was going to try and put the thing in check. And all it did was make it go, okay, now we're going to flex our muscles. And um, <laughs> so Tammy ran to her aunt's room after all the cru the crucifixes disappeared. And we're talking even ones around their necks. They were gone. We're talking, they didn't even feel them get yanked off the chain. Just gone. Okay. Um, and she, Tammy ran to her aunt's room and climbed into bed with her as Carmen read passages from the Bible. So, crucifix is gone. She's reading passages from the Bible. A hand begins to rise under Tammy's clothes and started groping her. They could see it under the clothing, groping her in intimate places. Yeah, the ass. Yeah. They should have realized, like, after the, the crucifix was gone, that the Bible's probably not going to be the thing that's going to work. So, comes back to one size fit does not fit all, fit most, fit many, fit some. Okay, you have to gauge what the response is. So as the hand began to rise under Tammy's clothes and grope her, her, Carmen could see that the, it, the hand was skeletal it wasn't it was Not just crazy. bones yeah and the bones of the hand and wrist through a cloth of her clothes were the most visible uh, once it grabbed her by the mm -hmm, down below as well as her left breast they screamed and ran to the dining room to escape it and it pursued Grabbing the only crucifix left in the house, which was a rosary that Tammy had put around her neck. It's not really a crucifix as much. It's basically, you know, it's just a cross and beads. And it grabbed the, the rosary around Tammy's neck and gave her a short arm clothesline, smashing her to the ground. Ouch. Yeah, it shattered the, the uh, beads and scattering pieces all across the floor. Now, I'm not sure because I tried to find out where the heck the other children were, where Carmen's other children were, but apparently they were at the other house with her husband. Now, they weren't estranged. That whole drinking crap didn't occur. And so uh, it was just her, those two there. I don't know why. Oh, look, let's let's stay in the house that's haunted now that the, the son's in the hospital. Such a mistake. Oh. <laughs> Oh well, come on! She did. She did shout at it and go, "Come and play with me." What's she expecting it to do? Just ignore her. Well, maybe she just thought that. You know, there's. I don't even know how to explain it. Some people they do that kind of stuff so they can have evidence, so they can have proof. And maybe that was her way to be like, "Well, I'm not crazy." Even though he might be, maybe his craziness was affecting me, so I'm going to yell out and see if something's actually here because he warned us. I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of, but I know if somebody would have been like, now that I'm gone, it's coming after you, I would be like, deuces, I'll drive eight hours to pick you up when you're out. <laughs> But it is. It's just like it's just like smelling yourself a, with raw meat and climbing into a tiger's den and going, hmm, "Tiger's not going to eat me today." A more modern version of that would be like in uh, uh, Pitch Pitch Black, where the girl ha was on her period and they were doing their best to try and keep her from uh, attracting the attention of all those creatures that uh, were afraid of the of the light. It's the same situation. Basically, she was a target, and they were doing their best to keep her from getting eated. So, it's it's bad this whole 
this whole situation in fact the the movie probably uh got my attention the most because of all of the ghosts that they showed staring the boy down having had that happen to me i don't know who came up with that i guess they just figured this is like the most imposing way that these dead creatures could probably address the uh, anybody having had that actually happen as a little boy yeah it's damn scary it really is they didn't show enough from his perspective to really give it the kick in the pants that it deserved they really needed to give it the full treatment so that you could if you wanted to and this was hollywood the thing that you should do is do the uh what was it um the name of that movie uh, a beautiful mind where you're seeing things from inside the the guy's head don't don't go outside of his head stay in there stay showing all the things all the feelings um and and show everybody's responses to it from the outside because that would make the most impact because philip dealt with a lot of crap it was horrifying and what what happened was the warrens finally recommended that the house be exercised by catholic priests by the way that's plural not just one um, and it was not the one that was dying of cancer, like they showed in the movie. After the Catholic priests came in and did their thing, which took quite a while, the place was drained of energy, and Philip was finally released from the mental hospital. Uh, and as you can guess, he never was the same with his mother. The feeling of betrayal was absolute. So that well, little yeah. coming together was done. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, well, if you ever, I mean, you expect your mother to help protect you. And if you say that there's something there, you expect her to believe you. Um, you don't expect your mother to be like, he's crazy, take him away. And even if she did do that, like, even if she did it to protect him, she still sent him to a mental institution. <laughs> You know, that's like a stigma that will stay with you. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if especially, um, I mean, even this day and age, having a diagnosis of some sort of psychiatric issue is a stigma, which is sad, which is really super sad. Um, but like in that day and age, you know, I'm sure if somebody found out that you was hospitalized for a possible psychotic break, it would be almost impossible to get any type of job. And that would seriously make a person like not want to talk, especially your family member, especially your mother. You don't expect that from your mother. And it comes back to the whole parent not understanding the child with gifts. And I don't believe the kid had gifts after he was, he no longer had to deal with um, the, uh, the treatments. Once the, uh, as from all the reading that I'd done, once he was, uh, this was one of the few truthful things in the, in the movie once again. Once he was no longer dealing with having to deal with treatments for cancer, no more cobalt treatments, then he no longer was so close to the veil. Which comes back to also not only the, hopefully the you know the parents need to learn not to just go oh the kid says something should yell at him scream at him throw him in, into a loony bin. Uh, the other thing is that um, you need to actually focus on the child's needs and believe at the very least in the beginning until you can figure out how to be able to to properly address it. Like, uh, I can't tell you how many times I told my family stuff and they just didn't believe me. And the response was exactly the opposite, like being through like the uh, coal scuttle that my brother threw me down at my aunt uh, Celia's house. That was fun. The guy who was down there in that thing, I, I don't even like to talk about it. It was the reason I didn't include it in the story that I sent to other people to read on their channels is because that one was really damn scary. And I didn't want anything to really seem like it was as close to the final event in Wales as this one was. I mean, the thing started screaming at me uh, and I ended up tucked in a corner uh, with my eyes closed and my hands over my ears, uh, unable to get out of there for nearly three hours. That took that long before my family went looking for me, which is another betrayal. It's like, yeah, just don't worry about it. Just leave, 
him to his own devices. And uh, it, it's a it's a familial betrayal. And nothing hurts quite like that does. And so ends the first episode, which is based on a haunting in Connecticut. If you like what we did here, please hit that subscribe button, like, comment, share with your friends. Uh, remember that we are actually in this to help people. We're not just here to talk about stuff. We are learning all the time and we would like to be able to reach folks out there in the world. You're ne it's never too late to be our first Patreon. And I'm joking about that because the reality is we have never had anyone go in so much as look at the Patreon page. <laughs> I know because the only person who ever looks at it is me, just in case someone might actually come in and drop a dollar here or there, but we definitely appreciate all of our viewers. Uh, it's not required that you, uh, do more than subscribe, comment, etc. Hopefully we can get to other people who are in need around the planet. In fact, Joel and I are discussing some things that are looking to be in the works in San Francisco, and we hope to actually be able to give you some data on that in the future. But for now, thank you very much and stay blessed. <laughs>